We're going to talk about uh, this man, George Crone. And why do I call him Crone? Because uh, my boss uh, went to Ireland. Uh, George Crone is from Ireland, and that's how they pr uh, pronounce it over there. And underneath of him, you see the buck and king of traders. George Crone in Cumberland Valley, in Cumberland County, in Pennsylvania, was an 18th century man who ran with George Washington, ran with Benjamin Franklin, and was a giant in his time frame. And we, at the very end, we might want to talk a little bit about why people don't know George Crone like Washington, like Franklin. We might, we might go there. But to start off, what I want to do is I want Janiel to come in and explain how this all started, this whole movement to get George Crone his due and eventually to get him an historical uh, marker. Janiel. Okay. So I, I love what the Franklin County Historical Society is doing in, in this type of a presentation because you have Colonel Hancock as a presenter and through that huge pedigree, which is incredibly impressive, um, it never said that he was a professional historian. And yet here he is with this, with this wealth of knowledge about this really important person. And that's, that's so important that any of us can become a historian. And in this instance, my path to George Crone was from this gentleman that you see between Colonel Hancock and, and myself, and his name is Gary Barrick. And Gary Barrick has no degrees. Gary Barrick was a custodian for many years at Hampton Elementary School. And I live close, my children went to school there. And I had taken a job as the education curator at the Cumberland County Historical Society. And when I took that job, I didn't know anything about Cumberland County history. I'm from Detroit, I'm like the Colonel. I've lived in a bunch of different states. I'm not native to Pennsylvania. And I certainly didn't know anything local. And it was Gary in the midst of trying to learn all of these things about Cumberland County that pointed out why I needed to learn more about George Crone. And so I think it's important that, you know, he's in this opening slide because this presentation in large part is because this interested person did the background research and helped to bring him to life to where we are right now. Okay, so we go forward. So this is our agenda, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk about George Crone's world a little bit here, which is very important. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about George Crone's background, and then we're gonna delve in specifically to his different. He's a, a very multifaceted individual. Matter of fact, I would consider him a Renaissance man. In uh, Pennsylvania, in uh, the Ohio country, this man could do it all. So we're going to talk about him being a trader, T-R-A-D-E-R, -E a wilderness diplomat, an Indian Sockham, or a wise man, a tremendous land speculator, military and political advisor, and an Indian agent. So, Janelle, you want to, anything on here, or go forward? Well, I think... <laughs> this idea of him as the buck in the beginning. So it talks about him as, as the buck. And so to set sort of a background about this guy, he was given this nickname by native peoples. So this idea of the buck, you immediately think, you know, these, this picture in the corner of these, these deer with the huge antlers and all that, and, and that's true. But the buck also has another meaning, right? We refer to it as money. So if you go to George Crone's time, animals were money, for example. So if you wanted to buy things, right, here's a price tag board. So a large male deer is called a buck, right? And so is a large male beaver, right? It's called a buck. So if somebody ever tells you you have buck teeth, it's not a compliment. You have the teeth of a large male beaver. So both of these are bucks. And then underneath are dough, right? So dough, not bread dough, D-O-E dough. So you've got dough here and you've got dough here. 
And these are money values. So when somebody says it takes a lot of dough to be worth big bucks, right? In our time frame, like we know that that means cash. And for them, cash was the actual animal. So this is a, this is a buck, right? It happens to be a beaver that's a buck. And then of course you've got your traditional, you know, deer skin here. Both of those are, are bucks. And when you wanted to buy things, you bought them in terms of how many bucks something costs. So this is a, a trade blanket. It's made by the same company that made them in the 18th century, the Hudson Bay Company. And its price tag is right here. And it's just brilliant. So you've got um, three and a half marks here. So its price tag is three and a half bucks. So it didn't matter what language you spoke. Didn't matter if you were Dutch, if you were German, if you were English, if you were Algonquian or you were Iroquoian, the price tag was noted here. So everything was purchased in terms of bucks. And then other animals like these, these beautiful creatures that I, that I have here on the table in front of me, each one had a value in relationship to buck. So like six raccoons was worth a buck, right? Four fox worth a buck. Two otters are worth a buck. And every fall and winter, or every fall and summer, a new price was set. And it was George Crone who set those prices. He literally was the buck. So you've got a man who is setting the economic platform for all of England, right? Not, not just here, but across the ocean. So you've got this Irish immigrant that comes and settles here that is literally the number one person in economics for the world at the time. So that world word, when we talk about him as the buck, that's George Crown. So just a little bit to uh, add on about this in uh, the particulars about George Crone, uh, like Janil said, he was born in Ireland in 1718. Then he was born of humble beginnings, right? This is, I personally like this, this, the great American story here. And where, of course, is he going to find fame and fortune? He's coming to America in 1741. Some of the things that, that are unique to George Crone, he learned several native languages, in particular, Iroquois and Delaware. So when he came here, he was not going to limit himself to being able to interact with people that just spoke um, in, uh, English, right? He was going to learn uh, what he needed, the languages he needed to get ahead. He had an intimate knowledge of Indian customs. I think that he became as Indian as the Indians did. Janelle, you want to add in on, on that, on how he did that? Um, he, he was one of those people that had this uh, emotional and personal intelligence where he could, uh, he could be one day with natives sitting on the ground eating dog and conversing, understanding wampum, which I still don't understand wampum. So this, this shell that was critical to uh, Eastern Woodlands culture he, he understood, you know, the difference between a war belt and a belt that united the nations. He, he could do this fluently. He knew how not to make like a, a cultural error because he paid attention. And then he could turn around and go sit in the governor's house and know exactly what was expected of him, of them there. So he could go between wealthy, he could go be to traders, to Iroquois, and each Iroquois nation had its own cultural patterns, right? And each of the Algonquians as well. And this guy was just fluid in being able to go back and forth, which is like amazing, amazing skill set. Yeah. So this uh, number five here, uh, I'll run through these. He regarded the Indian as a human being, in my view. And again, this is my view just a little bit. He looked at people like, sort of like the Quakers looked at people, right? He saw in them a person, not, not something that is different. No, you're a human being. So this ability to relate, it, it, when we get to what he actually accomplished, that particular skill set was very important. He was relentless in the pursuit of peace. Of course, one of the things he wanted 
was he wanted trade between the, uh, the Native Americans and uh, the British, right? And so to do that, you needed peace. You, you didn't want the French and Indian War. You certainly didn't want uh, Pontiac's Rebellion. You wanted to have this uh, economic intercourse between each other. And we'll talk a little bit about that also. He was fearless. Not only would he travel in Cumberland County, which of course at that time went all the way to what we know as uh, Pittsburgh, but he would go across and go out into the Ohio country. Matter of fact, in the eight, uh, 1760s, you would find him right outside St. Louis. Hardworking, talk about sweat equity. He was absolutely willing to put his money where his mouth was and go out and do the things that would get him ahead. And number nine, and you see this in his dealings with everybody, he was very shrewd, very shrewd in his ability to barter between uh, different entities. Do you know you want, want to say anything else, sir? Yeah, because he, he could play them off of each other. He knew what their strengths were. He knew what their weaknesses were, which, you know, think about that as a business person. Knowing your potential customer so well that you could end up on the good side of a deal. And that um, regarding the Indian as a human being, I can't, I can't emphasize enough why that made him different because the, the whole idea of England at that time was make the world England, right? Make everything bow to the cultural norms of England. And here you have George Crone that takes a native wife that has children in the native world that, um, you know, that, that kind of a, you know, defining character that, that makes George Crone really important. Yeah, and I'm, I'm gonna finish up on this. He was able to uh, have a bond of trust that you, you'll see in all his dealings that the, the Native Americans trusted him and he trusted them back, which was unique. Okay, a little bit about America and the world. This is a great map of, um, of America during this time frame. We have three major, uh, yeah, three major at this time frame uh, colonial powers here on the East Coast. We have uh, England, of course, Baltimore and New York and Philadelphia up and down here. Out here in the far west and down in Florida and Cuba, we have the Spanish, uh, Spanish uh, Empire up here. We have a little British influence, but not much is going up here. And of course, in the center of our country, down the Mississippi all the way to New Orleans, we have New France. Obviously, each one of those uh, colonies are coming to see what they can get out of the New World. Right. And so what was different, in my view, a little bit different is that in this figure, facts and figures kind of fascinated in right around 1750. In all of this. France had brought over about 80,000 people at this time. frame. Over here, you have almost a million uh, on the East Coast. So not only are these people over here, the English looking for resources bought they've brought settlers. And what do settlers want to do? They want to settle, right? And so they're going to start inching their way inland here, here in the, in the French territory. And, and again, this is where we're going to have the French and Indian War uh, break out. You have forts, and then you have uh, traders and trappers going out here. But over here, like I said, you have a million folks looking uh, on some place to go. Do you know you got anything? Yeah, and, and Crone, uh, you can see this is a divide. And this is theirs, this is theirs. And Crone crosses it. So he, he goes across and across and across and across. And Colonel can show him like he's going, he's going, he's going. He is really, really far into French territory. Right. And this is, uh, I got one more map of Cumberland county and a, a little closer one but this one right here we see philadelphia and we come out here in 1750 to carlisle right cumberland county out here and so crone is going to go from cumberland county here he's going to cross this major geographical barrier the allegheny mountains and head out here into french the french the french thought that was their territory and Crone is bringing British interest. And when he does this, especially when he gets up around Detroit, 
you're going to see the French start to react because uh, out here in all this, this area, of course, are all the native tribes. Up here are the Iroquois, down here are the Susquehannocks and the Cherokee, cross over here. Uh, we have the Shawnee and the Miami. He's going to go and to seek alliances where he can start getting these resources. And that, and we'll talk later about it, that's where we're going to see the friction, right? And of course, this is this has some things here that we'll see later. Here's Braddock's Road in 1755. Uh, where he's going, where he's going to end in uh, failure, and here's For Forbes Road across out to uh, Fort Duquesne, later Pittsburgh, in 1758. As, uh, Colonel, is this where you're going to talk about Celeron, or later? Yeah, okay, we can talk about Celeron. In 1749, the uh, commander up in Detroit puts a bounty on Crone's head, and what they're they're going to do is they're going to assassinate him. And they put a large bounty of to see Crone's scalp. And because why? Because it's just not Crone. Crone has a big enterprise and he has, I think it was 52 traders, yeah. his traders that either got captured or killed out here by the French. And the French are the one, I think it was Celeron, that in 1749 came all through this, this area and they started putting these metal plates on trees saying this is French territory. This is French territory. And Crone's going, yeah, whatever. And can and continue to try to make alliances out here in order to get what? Well, to get the resources that we'll we'll talk about here in a second. Yeah. So real quick, real quick on that is yeah, I grew up in Detroit and they never really covered French Indian War, except that this there was this thing about Celeron's plates, you know, mine, mine, mine. And imagine, you know, being being in your 40s and and being in Pennsylvania from Detroit and realizing, oh my gosh, it's Crone. This is the guy that provokes it. This is the man that provokes the French Indian War because he's so far into French economic pockets that that it's going to provoke the first world war in human history. And it's a dude from here. And so this is the, my last of the maps here. And again, what is very interesting, this is right around 1750. And here's the frontier, right? And so we have what's, uh, again, I think this is pretty interesting about how important he was. Here's Carlisle. We're going to make it the, um, the uh, county seat here for Cumberland County and down here is Shippensburg. And there's one other location on a map, and it's Crohn's. Crohn's has a trading uh, place where the marker's going to go, uh, about 354 acres up in uh, Hampton Township. And I, I have a picture of it later on. But he is so, from this trading place, he is so prominent that they put it on the map. And here is Crohn's Gap, where he crosses the mountains, right? Well, Crohn's Gap is now known as Sterrett's Gap. If, you, if you've ever been up there, yeah, Sterrett's Gap was Crone's Gap. That's how big this guy was. He was big enough that he's on the map, and the gap that goes toward now, toward uh, Pittsburgh, uh, is named uh, Crone's Gap. And, of course, over here is Harris Ferry, which is later going to become Harrisburg. Do you know you got anything else on this one? Uh, no, because I'm going to talk more about um, why he positions himself there a little bit later. Okay. So... Janelle already showed you some of the first she's got and why, and again, this is for me, it was good for both sides. You think of what uh, the Native American, where they were as far as uh, manufacturing. Well, in reality, they were still kind of in the Stone Age. They didn't have metal. So the trading was good for both sides. For example, over here, you have a musket. Here's a beaver pelt. Here's a deer skin. Ermine and Red Fox. Did I get them right, Janelle? Yep. Yeah. Janelle drilled that into me. So I learned like 18,000 different types of fur, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which I can, uh, oh, back up. So what would, a, what, what would the col a colonist want? And what would the, the merchants back in Philadelphia want? They wanted this stuff up here. They wanted this, the fur, the natural resources, so they could take back to... Um, 
London and take it back to Paris and they would sell it, sell it back in Europe. And of course, what would the Indians want? They would like these things. What's better, a bow and arrow or this musket? Well, yeah, probably the musket. A clay pot or this? Well, looks like I could probably cook a little better in this. What's better than this or the deer skin? I don't know. I would probably like that blanket. And of course, this uh, tomahawk is better than the war hammer. War hammer is a big piece of stick with a that's cut up like a, a club. So this interchange of of um, commodity or, or of goods, right? Of manufactured goods for um, the 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 resources of fur. Well, it was good for both sides. Go ahead, Janelle. The this idea of being somebody in trade, and we think, okay. It, it's money, that, it, it's true, but you have to consider what it's doing to native cultures. It's changing them completely. So the bow and arrow, they're completely independent. But with, when they trade up for the musket, it is obviously a, a better hunting tool. However, it will make them dependent. They can't get their own shot. They can't get their own black powder. They will get so the women no longer know how to make their own pots. They become dependent upon purchasing. Um, they, they become dependent on these metal tools. I mean, the smallest things like scissors or needles made out of metal, manufactured thread rather than animal tissue. And you get a native population that now needs these things. So imagine for us, it's like electricity. We, we need it, but we don't control it, right? We, we, we pay for it. So for the natives with George Crone, they got the best prices with the best quality, much better than the French, much better than other English traders. So he was the guy to go to for something that they needed. And when France and England start to clash with each other, Right, they have to have these trade goods. So they, they are an integral part of everything that's going on. So consider George Crone, who is trustworthy, and now he starts, now he becomes negotiator. So when you start to see, how do you go from a business guy, right, that, that knows their customers, how does he now become this political figure? Okay, George Crone, the trader, his first occupation, sort of, right? So what, what we said, what made him unique was that he was uh, multilingual. He could, uh, he could talk uh, uh, to the Native American tribes, and he also absolutely understood their, their customs. Uh, so what did he do? Again, we said he started his whole business here over at Crone's place, and Crone's place was more than just a house. It was a whole happening where people came there, they got refreshed, his traders came in there, and then the Native Americans came there too, talked business about what they were going to do, and then, of course, they started to go west. And again, where did he go? He went all the way out here, all the way past Pittsburgh, all the way up here, all the way over here to Detroit, down here. So his business was a big deal, of course, for the Philadelphia merchant, but it was also taking British interest out into French uh, territory or their, their claim territory. Janelle. Um, he is also starting to acquire massive amounts of land. Massive. So now, so those are the layers of him. Got him as a trader, got him as a land speculator, a land owner, and then a Native American negotiator. So want to go to the next one? And again, as Janelle said, this is going to be really, I know Washington and Fort Necessity, but this whole idea of interloping on French territory is going to be a major thorn uh, for the French. Okay, George Crone, wilderness diplomat. Um, if you read any of the accounts of, for me, again, a guy from Kentucky, any of these treaties, 
that happened uh, in uh, the 1750s, 1760s, and even into the 1770s, in, or and back to the 17, late 1740s. Crone is going to be there. Again, why? Because uh, the, the Native Americans trusted him. They trusted him as an honest broker, and he was fluid, and he understood their customs. I took this from one of the books I was reading about him. They said he was a key figure in nearly every important Native conference over three decades. So when the French or when the, the, the British wanted to try to do things with the Native American tribes, you can count on George Crone is there. They trusted him, the British trusted him, and the, uh, the Natives trusted him. And again, I, I put in there his linguistic dexterity and his cultural familiarity, and I put in these three. The Lancaster Treaty in 1748, it brought the Miami tribe into uh, the orbit with the British. Then uh, the Logstown Treaty of 1752, many places said this was the most important treaty that was, was ever done uh, with the natives because it en encompassed the whole um, Six Nation. And then I thought when he went and uh, got Pontiac, he personally got Pontiac to stop the rebellion and got mm -hmm. the treaty tri treaty signed in that. Yeah. Yeah, he, he negotiates both the end of the French Indian War and the end of Pontiac's rebellion. He's the only one that can get the natives to give up their captives. He's the only one that they'll listen to. So he, so interestingly, his trade provokes it. And then he's the same guy that can smooth it over and make it better. And um, the Colonel didn't include it, but there was a treaty in Carlisle, uh, I think 1753, where Benjamin Franklin comes and it's where the Taco Bell is in Carlisle, the five roads that cross in through there. So uh, Crone was the guy that negotiated that with Benjamin Franklin um, right here in central PA. Okay, uh, this is George Crone, the Indian Sockham, or, or the wise man. And what I did is uh, instead of trying to, uh, I just took this quote from the half king. And, and this is the same half king that was with uh, Washington at uh, Fort Necessity. He was the viceroy of the Six Nations. And I'll just read it to you if it's not real clear, and it'll take about 10 seconds. Brethren, it is a, it is a great while since our brother, the Buck, has been doing business between us and our brother of Pennsylvania, but we understood, understood he does not intend to do any more. So I now inform you that he is approved of by our council at Onondaga, for we sent to them to know how he has helped us in our councils here and to let you and him know that he is one of our people and shall help us still and one of our council. I deliver him the string of wampum. And again, that kind of encapsulates what he meant to the Native Americans. This guy was their man, and he was their man for a lot of reasons. But when you boil it down, it's they absolutely, completely trusted him to keep whatever promises that were going to be made. They trusted him, and, uh, and that's why they let him in his councils. And that, and that, this is being stated by one of the most respected of all the native leaders. So the half king has tremendous political clout, and he's saying, Crone's our guy. Okay, George Crone, the military and political advisor. Okay, I only put three up here, and but when you see... Uh, um, some type of engagement uh, in the French and Indian War around here, you can best that Crone is in it. And the reason why he's in it is he's trying to, the British have asked him to influence the native tribes to help out the British and not help out the French. That's what they were using him for. So I've just listed three of them up here. This is uh, Braddock's defeat. This is a picture of Braddock's defeat. And here's Braddock mortally wounded. Here's George Washington and there's George Crone. George Crone led the Indian scouts. He originally had 200, 200 Indian scouts. Uh, Braddock ticked him off something unmercifully that Franklin said was the reason why he lost. And this is Crone right here talking to one of the Indian scouts right before everybody. They had to bury Braddock on the road and, and everybody uh, pulled back to the east. 
1758, again, when General Forbes went out to take Fort Duquesne, it was Crone that the British were counting on to gather uh, or to marshal uh, the Indian forces to go with them. And then, of course, we had Bouquet's expedition during Pontiac's – look out there, buddy. Get back here. Bouquet's expedition in 1764, where he goes without and later Bouquet uh, has his uh, a win at, at Bushy Run. Janelle, you got anything? Well, I do because the, the painting is great. Robert Griffin's a, a great artist. But it's interesting to see what lens, you know, always in art, who are they, who is their audience. And Washington is featured, um, but Braddock's defeat at this point in history, Crone is a much bigger figure, right? Crone is for 30 years a much more prominent individual than Washington is. It's 1774 when Washington starts to take the stage. And actually that ends up um, in some ways being the end of Crone because he and Washington have interests that cross, especially in terms of land. And Washington's gonna be the one that comes out on top. The one that, the, he's the one that writes the history. Well. Exactly. So, yeah, he, and Griffin's playing into that here, but really, if I was going to paint this historically to that time, Crone would be face and you'd see Washington's back. Crone, the Indian agent. Uh, okay. Crone was uh, originally the Indian agent for the colony of Pennsylvania. He did that for a few years and then he became deputy uh, superintendent for Sir William Johnson for 15 years. And again, you think of what that is. He's the British Crown's deputy superintendent or the representative for you know, the Native Americans dealing with the Native. That's huge. It's a huge responsibility. And it says here, and again, this is a quote, as Sir William Johnson's right-hand man for 15 years in the Indian Department, he conducted treaties with Titi Umskung, uh, King of the Delawares, and hundreds of other Native chiefs. You have anything about that, Janelle? Or that's good. Okay. Okay. So. Yeah. Multifaceted George Crone, the humanitarian, the political. He was also a self-interested man, yeah. right? As as is everybody in their own way, right? <laughs> so this map, this is a map to illustrate Crone's land operation. So in Pennsylvania, he's going to own. 250,000 acres in Western Pennsylvania. In upstate New York, where he also has a uh, historical marker up near Cooperstown, I believe, uh, he had another 250,000 acres. And the big one is that down here in West Virginia and over, looks like a little bit into Virginia and into Kentucky, we have this colony called Vandalia, which was his sort of vision of the way the country needs to go, where we're, where we're, where we're going on that. So, Chenille. It was Vandalia was to be his own colony. So he gets all these acres in Pennsylvania and then he's fighting to keep it because the, you know, Washington's really on the other side of this, um, that they want the same land. And so he's constantly fighting to keep it. And he loses uh, a number of times. And then Vandalia is supposed to be his crown jewel. And he would have his own colony. It's West Virginia and Kentucky. And, uh, and then when the revolution happens, this, you can feel it slipping through his fingers. Um, so, you know, you've got this guy that's like, He's just killing it. He's making it. He's he's the man. He's the man. He's the man. He's the man. But always fighting to stay in that position. And then as we turn against the crown, George Crone starts to lose his standing. Right. Because so now he has to validate that he is one of us, you know, that he's not uh, in the hands of the British. And so he ends up this guy. He really ends up with almost nothing. Um, in the yeah. end game. So he goes from like the pinnacle, like so many of them, and with, you know, almost, almost penniless by the time, by the time he goes. Yeah, and what was interesting is during the, during, I think it was either 1775 or 76, he was tried 
for yes. being a traitor. Yeah, because he was so close to the crown, found not guilty. But that's, you know, that doesn't sit well with um, a lot of folks when they, they question your uh, loyalty. And a lot of it had to do with land, trying to get that land. And in, if you invalidate him, then you would invalidate his hold on the land. So this is a quote that uh, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm not going to read the whole thing. And obviously our pictures, but I'm going to hopefully find it here. And I'm going to take two more. Here it is. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read the whole quote, but I'm going to read you the first sentence and the last sentence. No man led a more adventurous life in colonial America. No man witnessed as many historic moments in the conquest of the old frontier. So that's the lead sentence, the last sentence. Crone was tomahawk, shipwrecked, alternately rich and poor, despised and praised, rejected and sought after. He walked with the great and humble of his day. He forcibly expressed the democratic spirit which was to be America. And so that last part is the one that Janiel likes the most is, yeah, here's a person who came here penniless. And then within three decades, he's one of the giants of um, Pennsylvania and the Ohio country, right? Yeah. So go ahead, Janiel. An uneducated Irishman. Just think about that for a minute. An uneducated Irishman has the king sitting on the edge of his throne at his every word. I mean, that, I mean, it's just incredible. Incredible. So here we go. Just, this is, um, this is uh, where the marker's gonna go. This was Crone's place. This is, uh, Janiel, why don't you just go ahead and explain these two since you're more familiar with them. Go ahead. Okay, so we moved here uh, about 25 years ago, but lived here, uh, for a couple of years before that, in addition, and this house was all, it was all covered. And then I remember when they stripped it down, you could see the logs. And I knew when I took the job at the Historical Society because of Gary Barrick, that this was what he said was his George Crone's home. And actually it wasn't really his home, it was his trading post. So the trading post was much more prominent than the home itself. So we actually, this is a rare thing to actually have a physical structure associated with, with, a, with a legend of his time. So the, the log part and, and actually part of a, another part of the house is original to George Crown in his time. And it was positioned here because, because of trade routes. So if you think anytime you drive on 81, there's a million trucks. And that's because from central Pennsylvania, you can get to 80% of the US population in under 10 hours by truck. I mean, think about that, 80% of the US population from right here in a single day's travel. And from right here, you could go anywhere. You go north, south, east, west, anything. And so he, he keenly, along with William Trent, understood this. And the, the picture that's the background, you can see it sweeping down into the Conna de Gwinnett. If you're familiar with Mechanicsburg, this is right by uh, Hampton Elementary School, up from Wendy's on the Carlisle Pike. And he owned all the way to Wordsville Road, right? So the Crohn's Gap is on the other side of it. And this was the place to go. So you went here for trade, you went here to see the news, this, this, positioning that he has is still so much a part of who we are today with the million warehouses and the trucks and all that. He had that vision in the middle of the 18th century, which is really quite remarkable. And the family that lives there, we're so lucky because they appreciate this and they love this. So they have exposed the original structure and have just been delightful to deal with in, in being able to put up historical marker. So there's the historical marker and just not to brag on Janelle, who is like awesome, but uh, this is her third one, correct? Is that right? It's the third one. We got one for the Bell Tavern after she was knocked down. And then I, I came into that too late. And I, I believe that one of the reasons they were able to knock down the Bell Tavern, which is the birthplace of 
the American Bill of Rights, which is like, wow. Um, but there was no marker. And people said, well, if it was so important, why didn't have a marker? So I thought, okay. So we got a marker for the Bell Tavern. And then there was another structure on the Carlisle Pike that was a dress shop. And it was the home of Oliver Pollock, which maybe, maybe one day you want to have us come back and talk about him, that guy. Amazing. Without him and George Crone, so much was, was possible between the two. So we got a marker for that. And then this one. And um, the last two have owners that are really uh, involved in preserving history, but they might not own it forever. So I thought if it has a marker, then maybe they can't tear it down. And so I set out to get the three. Uh, I don't have a new target in mind, but uh, so we wrote the application and really like look at the wording because when you apply for a historic marker, you make suggestions on what the wording should be, but they tweak it and they have to agree to wording that they can prove. And so look at what they have put on here, right? This is the guy who, la who launched one of the largest and most effective trade networks in America in the 1740s. And they, they hedged their bets because he didn't la launch one of, he launched the largest and most effective British trade network in America. So that the, the state is hedging their wording a little bit though. From, so from this site, and then he goes into French controlled Ohio country. Um, interesting. Uh, we had some dancing over learning languages because they wanted it to word it that he only learned native things to make money from them. And, and I think as uh, the Colonel and I emphasize, we do not believe that to be a truth. Um, you don't marry a native woman and essentially become native if you don't respect, respect their culture. You know, and think about it for three decades was the it says a key negotiator. So Conrad Weiser was also a big deal. No mistake about that. Johnson was, but it was the natives themselves that said, oh no, it's crone, it's crone. So there it is. So it'll go up uh, in April. Uh, Anne has the date. So we hope uh, uh, many of you will come out. We're gonna make a, a big uh, party of it. And uh, the third marker will go up for this guy from, that was here, the central PA.